Good morning and welcome to uh, the next edition of the FFS podcast. And this morning, I'm absolutely delighted to have a, uh, a Scarlet legend with us and, uh, you know, and a Welsh rugby legend and a lot, lot more than that as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce him. Now, before I do, it's not very often that I have sort of name envy, you know, with being called Finton Richard Godkin. I'm quite proud of that, you know, uh, and I could stand up with anyone. But Rupert Henry St. John Barker Moon. Good Welcome. Day, That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. And wait, what's your name, Fraser? Just, just a simple Fra Fraser Matthew Watson, mate. Nothing on ah. you. Honest. <laughs> I, I see you're going to be Bartholomew or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, you can have one of mine if you want. You can have one of mine. <laughs> Feeling quite inferior, yeah. Well, so how are you, Rupert? And uh, good morning to you. And how's uh, how are the current times treating you? We'll start with yeah. that first of all. Yeah, all's good. All okay. Um, um, the weather's fine, so I'm happy with that. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm quite happy about it because it gives you a bit of thinking time so everybody seems to be content in our household there's uh i've got two kids and a wife and there's a bit of social distancing <laughs> my wife works in the in the caravan and so uh, we're all kept separate for most of the time and then we come together to eat and that's it yeah i think that's the uh, that's the best way to do it isn't it you've got to have uh, you've got to have your sort of little hobbies while you're there and i can see you've been uh, fairly busy mind yeah if you're not on your uh, on your turbo or what bike or uh, or your juggling, so uh, you, you'd be doing a fair few sort of little challenges yourself, haven't you? And things to keep busy and yeah, I look, I'm in I'm involved in lots of different causes, which is lovely uh, to be asked to help and support. Just because I've been around for a long time, you end up knowing a lot of people who are involved in either charities or challenges, and they come to you in various different ways, and so. Yeah, I've, I've been involved and tried to do a little bit, but I obviously am 52, so I'm limited in some of the things uh, that one of your mates did, which was the old uh, Ryan Jones stuff. I can never be as extreme as that. But um, yeah, I try to do try to do and support different things. Did a couple of things with uh, Corey Hill and Dylan Lewis. But in the meantime, to keep myself sane, I just try and do little things. Everybody's painting and everybody's decorating, everybody's doing DIY. I have no capabilities in that area, as anybody who knows me <laughs> will tell you, but I try and do little wins to myself, which is um, getting on the bike, just trying to keep moving, even if I'm just going a little bit of a way, or just trying to set myself things that I think might be achievable. <laughs> Juggling was one. I put up another one recently that um, about either unicycle, uh, uh, play the ukulele or do a headstand so uh, i think uh, the vote is out so i'm gonna have a look this morning and see what people have decided i think i voted for the ukulele on that one well i had a ukulele for my 50th birthday a couple of years ago and i vowed that i wanted to be able to play a little bit because it's supposed to be yeah. the easiest instrument that you can play and i'm not musical in any way shape or form but it sat there staring at me and it sits by my bed and looks at me every morning and says, well, are you going to have a go? Are you going to have a go? And I haven't yet. So I just want to be able to do something. It'd be really cool. Yeah. You know, just something that sounds like it's supposed to be that. <laughs> well, I think you might have to do that quite quickly, mind you. Know, you've got about another three weeks, four weeks maybe, to learn a crash course in ukulele. But uh, I look forward to that. Uh, but on the bike stuff, uh, I mean, and every time I see you on there, you seem to be really pushing it. I mean, you're working hard. You know, it's, it's you know, a lot of heavy breathing, a lot of sweating. And best of all was, I think it's your son. Was it your son as your motivational yeah. coach? Yeah. You know? It's funny, you, when I finished playing, um, I, I didn't want to do anything. So I kind of ballooned and put about three stone on and focused on work at the time and eating and then doing all the things you shouldn't do work late, eat late, uh, lack of sleep, stress and all that. And then um, I realised and that this was at the time that my father had passed away, that I, I'll be soon behind him. So unless we do something, and that was me, my brother and my sister, we had to just try and do something uh, to ease the, the discomfort of what we were feeling. And I started walking. 
So I used to walk every morning. And my mate is a breakfast show presenter, so I talked to him while he was setting up and doing that on Radio Pembrokeshire. Tomo, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I used to walk at like half five in the morning, half four sometimes, for a couple of hours. And then because of walking, I just literally did that for two years. I was like Forrest Gump. Whatever the weather, I would just walk and walk and walk for hours. And then um, lost the weight. But then it was one of those things I just... If I were, uh, what's the point of training? I, uh, I'm not, you know, I wasn't, I was hit with the ugly stick at birth, so that it's not about vanity for me to get the old, uh, <laughs> the old muscles. So it was, there was no purpose to it, so I couldn't get motivated. But then I got a hook um, on my 50th to try and do some stuff to remember that year, because I'm not great on celebrating some things. And uh, one of them was to cycle. So I did a, a, a car ten, the car ten. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now I hadn't ridden. I hardly ever rode when I was a kid, but uh, so I got got into that to ride. So I did the car ten, which was painful but good with some friends, and then I rode to Paris with my mate Win Evans uh, in a hor in horrific weather for my the end of my fiftieth year and the, for the French game. And he hadn't ridden either. He bought a bike three weeks before Christmas. Uh, he was overweight and by his own admission, he was going through a very difficult divorce. Um, and he got on the bike and we, we rode for um, T. Haven to Paris. And it was awful because the weather, we had snow, rain, uh, but we had red wine and we had each other every night. <laughs> and so we were able to get through it together. And then I, I got an addiction to getting on and I, it was it's me v me and that's the that's yeah. the bit i like about the bike you're not racing anybody i'm not in a club I'm, i've got my brother-in-law's in a club there's other people but it's a it's a mental thing so i go to a, a class cycle specific yeah, where again you're not against each other it's you and the power yeah. and you decide how far you push yourself and the same um, with the turbo or just getting on the bike on the road uh, it's the you find a hill it depends what mood you're in if you want to punish yourself you go up Munnath um, Kellig or you go up um, the Minkiai or whatever it is around by me and you decide to do it that way because then you'll never won't allow yourself to be beaten by yourself will you? No, Rupert, were you one of those and maybe a lot's talked about professional sportsmen now when they retire and and I think some some really struggle. Some find there's a very big void there. Others are maybe better set up and have planned for it better. But just yourself there, when when the initial relief of maybe of of, of, of retiring, when that paves way, were you one of those who found there was a void? Um, certainly the competitive side of thing, the buzz side of thing. You know, even the, the endurance battle, the commitment that you've put in for so long, and suddenly that's nothing, that, that that's just all gone. Did you find then, after a certain amount of time, that there was a void that you needed to fill there? Um, I was lucky in the, in the transition I had. I'd been, because I, I spanned amateur and professional. So yeah. I was, I, I played for the Scots from 95 when the game went pro. Um, and then I had a comeback for Wales in 99 under Graham Henry when I thought that everything the world had ended. Um, but I had another few years um, when you've got to be careful what you dream for. I'd, you know, when I got dropped before the World Cup in 95, after we won the Championship in 94, I was devastated. And then my brother gave me a wake-up call saying you were rubbish anyway. So you, you kind of bluffed your way to get the caps that you had. So yeah. just thank you, <laughs> thank you, lucky stars. But I always believed that I'd have another chance. But in that period of uh, coming back to play for Wales again under Graham Henry I was able to and I was always given advice about um, keep relationships build relationships throughout and um, a guy a daily a daily mirror reporter Tom Lyons uh, it, when I was 18 19 years old uh, said always give people time and never forget that you got what that conversation is that may be the only time you meet these people so give people time and along the way i've always, i've met lots of people who have life experiences and always encourage you to remind yourself that you're a long time retired you know and sport is a very short career and if you weren't very good like i was and it could become to the, it could become very short much shorter so 
I'd got life experiences. I'd been involved in lots of charities. I'd done work throughout. So even from 95, I was amazed that I got a degree in government and politics. But I started to work in TV because I looked unusual and I had an unusual name. So even when it went pro, I was still doing work. So I was working and supporting causes. I was working in the media as a presenter or behind the camera. So when, I, when the offer was a, to go full, full time, I didn't take it. So I was, because you could only train so many hours a day. And so when it came to finish, when Graham Henry said, thanks very much, and Gareth Jenkins said, right, your time is up, um, I was in employment. And I was, I was working for, I started then to work for, I had a contract to work for Steve Hansen for the national team. Yeah. The, as the official water carrier, <laughs> the first one, the first ex-player to, to be a, a water carrier, set the trend then. Um, and then working as a career advisor with Steve to work alongside the players to try and understand them because there's this holistic approach that they had the New Zealanders did if you understand the person you can get the best out of them as the player and so I, my role was to work closely with the boys to find out what ticked and there was an eclectic mix and then Steve was able to push the buttons um, so that transition of retirement I had this kind of easing away because I was still in the environment and then when I had a, got a proper job, it wasn't such a shock, shock to the system. Okay. So I, I got it was the baptism of fire. My first proper job was working for the WRU and then working in commercial and business development with the stadium. So um, I was around that sporting environment. So I was one of the lucky ones, I guess. Sure. I remember seeing you, uh, is that one of the games, I think, after you'd retired there? Uh, could have been the All Blacks. They just done the hacker, and then uh, is it Bryn Terevin or the uh, the opposite? Or was one of the, the sort of opera singers came from behind the post with the flags? Bryn, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bryn. Oh, that was with, oh yeah, of course, yeah. Sorry, that was of course it was Bryn Evans yeah. in there, and then he came, and it, that was really good. Then I could see him coming down once he'd finished. Uh, you'd run on and sort of give him a high five, sort of thing. And uh, was was that your setup then? Was that the sort of thing yeah. you, were, you were there to do? I'd, be, I'd become the head of commercial for the WRU in the Millennium Stadium. Yeah. I had no real experience and the chief executive, or two of them, Steve Lewis and Paul Sargent, gave me the role um, to create a commercial team behind um, and there wasn't one in existence at the WRU in the Millennium Stadium then. And the team weren't particularly good at the time and we needed to focus on other aspects of what was going on and pre-match entertainment was one of them yeah. I tried to really get the get the crowd singing because the demographic and the, what had happened was different and that's an interesting story because the first time the hacker was ever done was against wales yeah. 125 years before that date um, and the hacker if you know is a laying down of the challenge so you're there they throwing down the challenge and you accept that challenge in any way you see fit as an opponent mm. first time it was done was against wales and wales sang to respond the welsh national anthem yeah. so that was their acceptance of it obviously then in the interim it kind of lost its way a bit and you can see in the 60s and the 70s it wasn't the focus that it was so 125 years later, we were celebrating our time and I approached the New Zealand Rugby Union to see whether they'd allow us to respond to the hacker, which means that you sing the anthem after the hacker. Yeah. Now, that doesn't happen. That, that's like a taboo thing because Adidas got involved. If you remember, it ch changed commercially and became a, obviously what more than a Maori challenge. They weren't too happy about it, but they made the concession that once and once only, because of what had happened 125 years ago, to do that. Yeah. Now, um, we did it and we did the anthem after, but just to stick a little bit of a, a little bit more in, I had wind behind the posts. Now, wind's a mate of mine, and um, I had a, I didn't, the shirt was a little bit tight on him, <laughs> but we, he was, so I got him to sit in the crowd 
And in those days, we didn't have all the technology. It was only 2005, which feels like a 15 years ago. We didn't have radios or anything like that. So I had a towel. <laughs> so we had the New Zealanders doing the hacker. We had us singing the Welsh last them. Behind them was the choirs. And then sitting in the crowd under the post was win. So the, anth the hacker was, was great. The anthem was brilliant. Then I dropped my towel. Wynne walked on with a flag and the parting of the choir as he's walking down the field doing Bread of Heaven a cappella. Now he looked like a, obviously a crazy supporter, which at first it looked like that's what he was, but obviously with Mike too. And, then a, and it, was, it was absolutely an amazing experience. Um, but the flip side is we try, a couple of years later, All Blacks came back and I tried to do it again. And if Keith Rowlands was the president of the Welsh Rugby Union, I think then, and uh, he said in our house, as in, as in the Millennium Stadium, we should be able to do what we want. So we approached the All Blacks again and said we'd like to respond positively with doing the hacker. And at this time, I think Hanson was there in, with the All Blacks then. And um, anyway, they didn't they didn't respond. This is six months out, five months out, four months out, three months out, two months out. Um, Gareth Jenkins was the coach as well, I think it was. Anyway, um, we went to the WRU board, they're not responding. The WRU board agreed that and Keith Rollins had died in the meantime, he passed away. So, <laughs> the week of the game, they still hadn't acknowledged it. Seven days, five days, four days, three days, day before, nothing. And we went to a WRU, a WRU board meeting on the morning of the game saying, well, I don't know what they're going to do. I, what do you want to do? Well, in our house, it was our former, you know, our ex-president's wish, you know, we'll respond. But if they're not going to acknowledge they're doing the hacker or whether they are, we'll just get on with it. So anyway, if you remember that game. I was at that game, yeah. So the we, I'm standing in the player's tunnel and mm -hmm. there was no hacker. And I'm, I'm going, well, blimey. Next thing we know, we look up at the screen. We're standing next to my chief exam. Look at the screen and there's that recording of the hacker. And I'm going, what the hell's happened here? And basically what had happened, the All Blacks had got a Welsh cameraman to film it, knowing that it would be this what shows that it's a, what it is. It's actually an Adidas advert, nothing more than that, and no respect to the opponent. This was about them, not about laying down the challenge. They recorded yeah. it, gave the bloke in the truck a couple of quid, who played it out live, BBC, and stuck it on the screen. As you can imagine, the crowd were booing, thinking that we'd forced them to do it, and they'd done it. Now, I looked in the dugout, and there was the, I knew the cameraman was sitting with the, the New Zealand subs. I grabbed him, and I'm dragging <laughs> him down as a traitor, because it wasn't us. You know, I'd had, I got Mary Elders, I've got, you know, people from Wellington University, and this, you know, it was a key thing is allow us to show respect to it in an appropriate way. And they bung the guy a couple of quid, they put it and everybody thought, oh, the Welsh Rugby Union had forced the All Blacks to do the hacker in the dressing room, which was never the case. It was just the fact that they wanted to have the last say before the final whistle. And if you faced it, it ain't pleasant. But then obviously subsequently, when we've had New Zealand coach like Gatland has been able to orchestrate it to be able to then reverse it on at key occasions it is nuts but yeah, yeah. that that was an incredible surreal I, experience but win just going back to the story yeah. win went for the job of the go compare guy not long after that <laughs> it was remembered because Haley parsons who's the owner of go compare was in the stand he's a massive rugby fan a, a woman of Bryn Mawr just down the road from Amtaleri where i first yeah. started and obviously, when you're trying to, act, you're looking for different personalities. I'm not saying he, I got him the job, but <laughs> I tell you what, it gave him a good leg up when he was walking down the field with millions of people. But the problem it was that we had, we got beat that day, and the All Blacks. It says the All Blacks had the hacker, and Wales had a fat bloke in a shirt, and then that was it. And that was uh, so he was remembered for all the wrong reasons. Well, I remember it positively. I I loved that actually. I remember I remember being there, you know, uh, and and when it happened and he came out, I thought it was really good. Like you know, and uh, it's the emotion and when everybody got to it, and you, like yeah. he talked about it, it, it does when you're singing a cappella and he's got a great voice. Yeah, 
And there's a guy who got into who's recent, from that day we started cycling. So, he's now cycling and he's running. So he's he's yeah. doing. He did five k. His best five k. Lost three stone recently because of um, the the first ride that we did together and we stuck together. And then he's just become more yeah. active. And this lockdown has allowed him to refocus and realise what's important is health. Yeah, I think that's it's done that for a lot of people. To be fair, I mean, you you've mentioned it a few times. I've seen you uh, on a few things. You always sort of uh, play down your playing days. You always know, say, "Oh, I, oh, I was lucky. I was my brother told me I wasn't very good." But you know, if we just go back to your playing days, you know, when you were playing for the Scarlets or Slesley, the the club then. Uh, I mean, you was one of the most successful sides around. Like you know, you were, I think you, you were double winners, beat the world the world champions you know in you know australia at the time so uh you know to say uh you know i mean that that's leslie side you played in was full of characters and it was a real uh a real star set aside wasn't it yeah i think i think every team that i played in when it was Amtelary in the 80s yeah you know three seasons with them there were personalities and characters in that 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 helped me become the person i am and i had the one year with neath and that was the times of Brian Williams and yeah. Kevin Phillips and Kembury and Lynn Jones and Roland Phillips, Mark Jones, Thorburn, late. And obviously walking into that Scarlet dressing, Clefley dressing room with Phil May, Lawrence Delaney, Garrett Jenkins as coach, Nigel Davis, or Yian Evans, larger than life personalities. Yeah. And again, I always use that. They, we were odd pieces of, jig, of a jigsaw that at that period of time kind of came together. I was an odd one. And that I was able to fit into that that mix of players that we had to get that incredible season, and it was an incredible season. We were fitter than anybody else because we had a, a great fitness guy, and we did a lot. Um, we were more skillful than anybody else because Gareth Jenkins wanted us to overplay, and then we had players that could play and were brave enough to play. You got sometimes you've got to be brave and have a go but you've got to be given as in business you've got to have the confidence to fail and you've got to you've got to have the go well if you don't go right i know that i'll be able to have another go and no one's going to have a go at me if as, if i've done it with a realization that it's possible i know for, in the professional game now for touring sides it's a, it's a different kettle of fish and it's a different schedule and maybe what i'm about to talk about isn't plausible but looking back on that that Australia Day in particular for you and your captain to Nestle and it became iconic, the image of you being carried off and obviously there's so much history in Nestle with the All Blacks result and things like that. Is it sad you now that there isn't a space for that for touring teams to come over and warm up against a couple of clubs? I, used to, I remember watching them as a youngster and they were passionate affairs and the crowds you had there, they're almost different to a Wales crowd. It was, almost, it was more of a colloquial once in a lifetime feeling to it. I remember it wasn't a club side, but I remember, for example, the 97 New Zealand tour, Wales A playing them in Ponte Pride. And it was a real din inside Sardis Road that night, a real like, passion and feeling. And you don't get that. Are you, are you sad there's not a place for that in the game anymore? It, in one way, I am because the fact that, like you talked about, it, young people today will never have that experience that we did. And, and I think. Um, but it is a bit like basketball or netball. That was then, this is now. Yeah. And I, I think when you reminisce, um, we had the best of times. We're selfishly always going to say that. But if you talk to Graham Price or JJ Williams, they say they had the best of times. Yeah. Mm. And, I, and I think we all, it, you, you have to just kind of go, that was great. That was then. Uh, there's going to be a new experience as long as the hierarchy who are making these decisions are helping to make those experience is possible and I think what I called it, it was character building playing real rugby for Abitaleri and playing real rugby for Neath and Clefley and it was in the same way for those touring time uh, teams that was an unusual experience that helped them build character you know you get John Eels or you, uh, you you know in that team who's a, who's a young guy but it was a unique character building experience I do worry in the professional era that you don't have those character building experiences along your journey because you've got to be challenged. How do you get mental toughness? 
how you can get physical toughness to a degree but how do you get the desire to get up when someone's hit you hard how do you know when you know you talked about i sweat a lot on the bike i push myself because it's me versus me and in games i've looked around when i've been hit hard or i've made a mistake or i'm absolutely blowing that i'm doing it for my teammates but also i know that i can dig deep to go again now in a in the professional world it's a very clean sterile environment the academy system you're playing against the same people you played against 16 17 18 19 20 going to a wet horrible um cross keys or a narbeth uh, tough envir <laughs> environment in the west or a, mm. a difficult pontypool park on a friday night is character building because you've got to you've got to get on with it you've got to tap it up so i think um it's just a di it's just a different experience playing for those international teams and we were really lucky to get a crack at them mm -hmm. and they'd never seen anything like it so you you get there is nothing you can prepare yourself for that and i when with wales i went to samoa and i played in samoa on a, on a school pitch when they moved us to the national stadium and the crowd were right on the the touchline and that was a unique experience and stood me in good stead because it, it was bloody tough it was hard it was hot it was physical but it was another one in the bank it was another one ready that yeah. i can use it when i need to when there's other games that i i need to dig deep and i know that i've got that resilience yeah, I, I just, say gonna say touching on something you you talked about earlier then you obviously you had those great times when it was still the amateur era internationally you were one of those who made the transition through to professional how did you find that transition and also again without trying to bring a sour note into this what you touched on earlier the la almost what was the last bastion of the amateur era the 95 world cup which, which you missed out on how much did that hurt you and, and give us the circumstances about around that um so the tra so firstly uh, in 94 we won the championship in 94 and i was yeah i, I was lucky and in the right place at the right time for what the team needed and i do i am self-deprecating in some ways that I, I wasn't the best player but i fitted into that team for 94 robert jones had had a great tour with the british lions in 93 uh if you remember he had that bashing with nick, nick far jones yeah. and it was great but he came back and i'd been on the bench for him in 93 in 94 the pack we weren't as strong and Alan Davis wanted to play a particular way. And I was the dive pass king. I'd get it in and away, get it in and away. Rob was more of a, a set piece, solid uh, base kind of scrum half. Okay. We won the championship in 94. There was lots of, we went on tour in that summer. The coach fell out with the WRU hierarchy, ended up uh, having Alex Evans as the coach from Cardiff. Alex Evans came in, yeah. yeah and it, it, I was bitter because we'd worked so hard to qualify for that World Cup. We'd done well in 94. Mm. And when we, eight of us weren't selected for 95, but I eventually understood that he had to take, he had such a short lead time, he had yeah. to take people that he knew and had confidence in. You surround yourself with people that respond to you quickly in a short piece of time. I got it in the end it was difficult at the time mm. they had a very difficult awkward 95 world cup as you can imagine yeah. it wasn't wasn't great so I, I professionalism came i was working but they offered us uh, quite a lot of money but i'd also had the and like we all did we all signed up for kerry packer in those days so uh, you may not be aware 95 um there was a global league we're listening to talking about globalization of rugby yeah. now and the coronavirus will cause this and that may be one of the positive outcomes there'll be a global rugby calendar which will fit everybody in the kiwis didn't want it and that's and we didn't want it because six nations is in that prime time slot for bbc not for rugby because it's in the wrong place really for rugby the six nations but it's a cash cow it's a massive mm. cash cow. it's actually the mini rugby junior rugby have more sign-ups off the back of the six nations they do at any other time in the year you think it would be august yeah. naturally off the back of the six nations because terrestrial tv but if you that from the from the calendar being sorted and the transition of signing for i signed for kerry packer which was going to create a global international league we all did everybody across the world and it was like i felt like a million dollars i think it was like 90k or something we signed for <laughs> 
But the problem, it all fell like a deck of cards because I think South Africa won the World Cup and they got a little bit greedy, wanted more money and the, we all it all fell apart. So then it became, if you remember, Vernon Pugh signed and said yeah. overnight, the game is now professional because of that. Because of that. No one was prepared. The clubs weren't prepared. And they just said, right, come to work tomorrow. We're playing you whatever it is. And you're working an eight-hour day. I mean, an eight-hour day. So we had to rock up nine o'clock. And they just kept us there for five days a week, just like training and doing that. And that lasted, I don't know, a couple of months maybe before they realised, actually, we can't do that. Physically, we can't do that. Yeah. And, uh, and it took, well, we had an investor from down in West Wales. I think he offered to give us a million quid to help develop the professional game at the Athletic. He owned a caravan park. Anyway, by the end of September, he said, uh, I don't want to give you a million quid anymore. We'd signed Frano Botica and um, a proper New Zealand, a proper we got rid of before he even arrived. But Frano stayed. And Frano stayed um, meant the club were then on the brink of um, bankruptcy because we couldn't afford to pay him and everybody else and keep going and there was no money in the game and then eventually this transition sort of slowed down and then people realized you had to have some sort of employment and then it was very difficult because some people had significant salaries and some people didn't and that caused a, a riff for a few years yeah it it's i mean it's uh it's really interesting that you say all that because you hear the stories or the moments that, you know, when the game became professional, it just people weren't ready for it and they just didn't know how to handle it. And, and you guys would have been in, you know, in your sort of prime in the middle of your playing. Yeah. And I mean, and it goes back really to what you're saying as well with, uh, you know, the characters. So when you're playing, first of all, you know, you're going into a changing room, like you mentioned the Leith changing room, you know, you've got farmers from West Wales who first language is Welsh. Uh, and then you might have city slickers from Cardiff, you know, as lawyers or, and then policemen in there and such a diverse people in, in a changing room of a, of a you know, like, a, like you get at a club side these days, but in a, a top level team. Um, Look, it's a scary experience walking into a dressing room for the first time. Uh, the Neath one was particularly daunting <laughs> because I'll, I'll never forget going in there. And if you're ever into the Knoll, the yeah. Neath dressing room is about as big as this room. It's very, it's small, um, very compact. And I'm walking in, as I mentioned, some of the names that were in there. You know, there's Alan Bateman's over there. You've got Lynn Jones, Roland Phillips. You've got Hugh Richards, Tough Men, Paul Jackson, Kevin Phillips, Brian Williams, Jeremy Pugh, Paul Thorburn. And I'm, I'm looking, where do, you, where do you sit? Where do you go? So I went in and just found the little spot. And I'm Rupert. Come from Amicalary, <laughs> born in Birmingham, confused individual, looks a little bit unusual, wandering in into the, you know, the Neath All Blacks dressing room, as you said, yeah. with characters and personalities, and they don't suffer fools gladly, these boys. So I went in, then we just sat down, sat down, and everybody's getting changed. And, the, and there was a ritual in those days that um, you get ready, but you go out together training. You'd always go out together. You wouldn't, Neath were just, training was like a game. You know, Kevin Phillips was was kind of God in those days. Um, so I went in, sat down, and I'll never forget, just putting my kit on, and the next thing I know, the lights go out. I don't like the lights go out. And I look up, and all I've got in my face is this pink jockstrap bulge, to like a lump, just here. So I'm like n nose to jockstrap, as I'm sitting up in the dressing room, like this. And there's a bloke standing there, just in a jockstrap, right in my face there, this massive, and I'm like, Look up, and there it was. It was Mark Jones. Mark Jones was what six foot five, six foot six, giant of a man. Anyway, he looks at, he looks down at me. I look up at him, and he goes, and unfortunately, Mark has got a stutter, but sings like an angel. And I can tell you another story about. It. So he's looking down. Ron's told me to look after you, and I'm like, oh great. So he then swivels round, bends over goes into a kit bag which is just behind me in front of him so i've got a view a different kind of view <laughs> behind me so i've got mark jones in a jock strap bending over in front of me i'm a little bit nervous at that point there's 25 other guys in the in the dressing room just getting on with it he flips around and he hands me a handful of tablets and i'm like 
And he goes, <laughs> take, take them. So I'm like, uh, right. And there were, as I, I found out after, it was five desiccated liver tablets. And if you've ever had desiccated liver, it's not great. So dried liver, massive tablets. Chewing them, goes in then, gets vitamin C, gives me those. He says, Ron wants you to build you up. Make it tough. And so he, I'm chewing these and I'm like this. So every training session, he'd give me these desiccated liver tablets. But as a, once we were ready, Kevin says, I'm ready. We're all ready. We do seven laps of the field. No one cuts a corner. There were no flags at the knoll. Seven laps as a warm up. Don't overtake him. He sets the pace. And then we go into the 40 minutes of unopposed. And then we go off running up the knoll. But that experience in the dressing room was the same in the Scarlet's. When I went to Clentley, going into the dressing room, where? Straddy infamous dressing room going into the dressing room I sat there because I, I moved there the year after sat in the corner but I was greeted by a different sight then I sat in the corner head down you know I didn't want to you know upset anybody I'd learnt my lesson just keep sitting no one will be there next thing I know I got this horrible looking thing in front of me which was Lawrence Delaney <laughs> and Lawrence Delaney naked ain't a great look he's had a he's had a He's got a world of life written on his body. He works in the steelworks. He's been, you know, he's got scars all over him from when he's protected scrumars, as he used to say. And he had some unusual features, let's put it like that. And he just told me in no uncertain terms to get out of the corner. And I was like, it took me, didn't realise why, until I looked up and there was a heater in Stradi. There was one heater. And he'd been there for 500 games. And you earned the right for the heater, which was in the corner. Took me four years to get to the corner. I was captain in my second year. We were in the corner with the heater because that's lovely and warm after after training when you're coming up. It's raining. So dressing room environments are all quite unique, and characters yeah. and understanding them is really key. How old were you when you went to the uh, to the Nall then, to Nice? So I would have been 1920, 20 maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh, like 60, yeah, yeah. 20, 22 maybe. Yeah, 22. Because that was the great side. So we, yeah. I played exactly half the games that season. Bridgie, Chris Bridges yeah. was the captain. But Ron had said, Ron Waldron, and Ron, you won't play for this. I played in a trial against Morriston on a Thursday night, only because I'd been on tour with Crochets and uh, Ray Giles had suggested that I'd try and take the next step in my career. I've been done a few seasons at Antilleri, drunk in France. Long, another crazy story, you're a right, top man. Um, and I'd gone to a trial and I played the game, done all right. You kind of have an audience with the Pope. It's like with Ron, Brian Thomas, after after the game, walked in there and he said, uh, you'll never play for this club. So I said, thank you very much for the opportunity as I'm walking away until you're fit enough. So basically I did pre-season with them, but I didn't play for a month. Just going back, yes. So when you enter a dressing room, whether it was when it was Neath, which was unique and having the pink jock strap, to um, to walking into the one at Straddy Park with Lawrence Delaney naked saying, "Get out of my corner because you're under the heater and I've played 500 games for this club. You earn the right, good boy. You earn the." Um, it was it was those personalities that make you the person that you are. You know, made me. You know, Lawrence Delaney protected me. You know, and he'd had a, a lifetime of experience working um, in the steel works, mm -hmm. but also having rugby experiences and then whatever the things that happen in life around it. Phil May, uh, Phil Davis, you know, Colin Steves, they're all characters in their own right. And if we go back to that, that time about being dropped before 95, they helped me in that transition um, to come through the other side, you know, from amateur to professional, and that dealing with what was required, understanding what hard work was, mm -hmm. and then just working for the the team. Um, so you you surround yourself with good people, and I think the oh, that's the, that's in life, isn't it? And I'm very lucky um, that the groups I've been in mm. large. I've been best mates with all of them. You don't, you're not best mates with everybody in your team. Um, I'm sure I frustrate lots. Others will feel the same. But together, we were able to do some great stuff in that, certainly in the early 90s. And then we had another good rush 
in the, in the late 90s because it t- takes time you, you know it's yeah. the three, they talk about the three and the six year cycle as Gatlin did you know it, he he was the beneficiary of an investment mostly by Graham Henry in this broader pod system which was making Welsh players think which I was on that carrying water in those days which was like blew Chris Wyatt's mind because go to the third mall go to the fifth ruck you know yeah. four, not get involved in everything but then Steve Hansen invested in people people because you only get experience by getting experience yeah. you've got to do tough stuff different stuff you've got to have life experiences on and off the field of play to give you experience <laughs> so you're going to go through it and he was yeah. he stuck by people and that's where you talk to martin williams steve jones shane williams eventually and i think that was part of his plan anyway that they all are better players and better people for the experience of being involved in that and when gatland got hold of them he gave that winning thing I don't care how you play he just had the he had the ability with robin mcbride and um Rob Howley and Sean Edwards to find the the equation, regardless of how it looked, to make them win. Because yeah. I think in international rugby, you know, you are, you know, you know, you represent your country. You're judged on your results, and you, you know, you it's a winning environment. The country wants you to win. Everyone wants you to win. But I always thought, you know, looking in from the outside, obviously, with Hansen, is that he he sort of did stick by his guns, and and he was always all about putting Wales in a better place and leaving it in a better place and and yes. sacrificing results maybe not not that he, they didn't go out there to win and he didn't no, want he to did. win but he did. No, yeah he did yeah. It was, um Graham Han- Henry handed over the baton to him and Steve was an up-and-coming coach and he was investing in his development and but he at his core uh, it was about the player mm. uh, you know you hear phrases like you know if you look after the basic the, the winning comes don't worry about the winning if you get all the other bits right it, that will actually that's a natural that's what will happen because he had andy hoare who was the fitness guy and he had scott johnson who was the creative guy they were able to um come up with the potion but it was about performance and it wasn't about winning he was able to say that and be that way because Steve Anson doesn't give up in about anybody. Mm. Steve Anson is that strong enough character he, that he was able to do that. He is and he's a really lovely guy. I mean, what you see on the TV and his lack of um, not finesse, he has no time for people that he doesn't doesn't yeah. respect. And from a media point of view, he plays the game. But players though, and the time that he gives you, and his holistic approach of understanding you as a person supporting you when you go through difficult times. You, if you watch that All Blacks documentary, there's a the All Blacks documentary is on um, Prime, Amazon Prime, behind the scenes, and that's the most real one. And I've seen lots of documentaries. That's the most real one I've seen. And Hanson comes across as a, a human being, which most people don't think he is. Ex copper detective. Um, but he was able to make a significant difference in people's career because of the investment in performance, not winning. The business of rugby is what has allowed the Welsh Rugby Union to survive this long. Roger Lewis, whatever you think of him, made a crit- critical business decision to get a bloke and say, Warren Gatland, you have whatever you want, but win everything. Win everything that you can. I don't care how you do it. Because if you're winning, you get the numbers, you get the sponsors on the shirt, you get the naming rights sold, you get the perimeter advertising, you get all the hospitality sold and the feel good emotion. Actually, in the early days, we played less and won more. We had mercurial talent like Shane Williams and people like Martin Williams who would turn over ball and different things. But actually, if you remember, it was we played ping pong, we had Lee Byrne kicking the ball and then we had that, it was going ping, ping, ping and it was who, who gave up in the end. Then we had defence, so then we tackled lots. Then we had bash, we had Jamie Roberts running through brick walls. In those first few years when we were really successful, we played limited stuff. We still scored spectacular tries, 
but we won. We won, and he stuck together a group, a squad. And again, you have to. The stars have to align, but also your predecessors have had to invested to allow those players to come of age at that time. That team that Ruddock won in uh, the championship was in five, yeah. years before. I, I was going to come into that. I think. I don't come on to that. I think what Hansen actually put in place by the time he left at the end of the 2004 Six Nations campaign really was the springboard for Wales to win the 2005 Grand Slam. I don't want to take anything from it. I think what Hansen did was very brave because Hansen almost went back to basics. And, um, okay, there is an argument that, you know, halfway through the World Cup, he almost, he almost accidentally fell onto this new style of playing because New <laughs> Zealand, you know, the... the, the uh, the side that went out that day just threw caution to the wind and it came off. But certainly in the Six Nations that followed, the style that Hansen implemented and the players that, that he elevated then went on to do it in 2005. And I'm not sure he's always had the credit for that. Grand yeah. if you, there was an article the other day about, you know, if, you, if anybody understands, if you're an international coach, you have hours with a team prior to internationals you know, they talk about days, you're only, you're 40 yeah. minutes, a month, you know, an hour, half an hour, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, you know, you don't have much training time, you cannot, uh, in a, in a, within a, a couple of hours, make a team what it was, you needed years, and that's what Hansen did, he got players to think creatively, gave them, he gave them confidence to be themselves, those, those players that I've referred to have always been there with their natural ability, he yeah. just gave them the belief to go out and do it. That game plan against New Zealand was about self-belief. It wasn't by accident that that happened. And we talked, Shane talks about how he wasn't looked at because he was little and he wasn't. Yeah. But he changed. Physically, he changed. He developed yeah. to get to the, being that player. And he became the world's best player. And, but it was not by accident that someone probed and pushed him. And the yeah. support of Hansen and the support of Hoare and the support of Johnson and the, the environment that was created. You know, they, they were able to have a kind of create a club team to a degree uh, because everything else wasn't great around it. At the time, it wasn't great. There was a lot of uncertainty in regional rugby and all that yeah. was going on. And yeah, then absolutely. when Gatlin came in, what Roger Lewis did was invest heavily in the back room. So they had the best facilities, the best pitches, the best coaches, the best um, fitness guy, and all of the people in that environment to, to provide success. And Gatlin had had a hard journey himself, because of the, but he also admits that he was in the right place at the right time. And his coaching journey, if you read up about him, mm. you know, the whole going from coaching whatever that club team was in Ireland when he was playing for New Zealand and staying and yeah. earning that stripes to then coaching Connaught to then going into that Irish team was just by fortune as much as anything to allow him to have the Ireland team when they were just at the right time. Yeah. And, it, and same with Wasps, you know, he, he you know, he's, you got the stars are going to align. And I know better some coaches that never, the stars are never aligned. The players, you know, when I was playing, there were better scrum hours than me, but, they didn't quite fit into the team that was required at the time. Well, that's life, isn't it? You, you, it's, have um, to, you make your own luck to a degree. Interesting concept, that Rupert. That bring me on to my next question. Now, you were obviously worked so closely for so long under Gareth Jenkins. Now, uh, you know, Gareth Jenkins is just such a likeable figure. I've worked with him myself. The, the emotion he gives, the attachment, he, he just engages you when he speaks, you know. And I think... From that point of view, it's, it's almost a tragedy that never really quite worked out for him as a Wales coach either, because it was your job he covered, he coveted, and many felt he deserved for so long. But firstly, tell us what it was like to work with him, not necessarily from, you know, his passion, his emotion, because we're all aware of that. But as, as an actual coach, we don't hear much about him as, as an actual coach and, and rugby brain. And also, why didn't it quite quite work out with Wales? Um, well, I was just going to show you. I'm he call, I speak to him every week, <laughs> so he's got, he's rung me already, so he's rung Mr. Call from him this morning. So. He's not allowed to speak in now, is he? <laughs> no, no, he's, uh, he's like my adopted father, you know, and that's how, uh, you know, I, I had the fortune or misfortune that his dog was called Rupert, so um, I'm in the big scheme of things. Gareth Jenkins calls his dog Rupert, which is a nice compliment. Nigel Owens calls his new uh, 
Cow, Rupert as well, Bull, <laughs> Rupert as well, which I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. The two of them, two Ruperts. Anyway, um, Gareth Jenkins, if you know anything about him, had a tough upbringing. You know, he started working the steel, was very young, um, had an injury quite early in his career. But as a person, um, he's able to simplify, simplify the picture. He's able to understand people and inspire people as any leader needs to. Um, and everybody needs the understanding there how to inspire them. And he was very good at doing that. Uh, he was also very good at finding different pieces. I keep referring back to pieces of the jigsaw. We are, that's all we are. Finding those pieces of the jigsaw and had a, a good support mechanism around him. So it's not a lot, he's not alone in that. When he was a player, Tom Hudson, who was the fitness guy who came from Bath, allowed the Clethley to be a fitter team in the 70s. And that was an innovation then. When he was starting yeah. coaching Clethley, there was a guy by the name of Peter Herbert. I think he was going to be the oldest Iron Man this year, yeah. who was who's a lecturer at College Cigar, who's in his crikey, he's in his late seventies now. Yeah, uh, he was able to get us fitter than ever. And the legend was, was about Peter Herbert, Randy, that he held the world record for the amount of dips. I never found out if it's true or not, but the amount of uh, yeah, dips that was on true. Two. That was true. Yeah, yeah it was true. Is it? Look, and he was our, um, we were fit at Neath through Unopposed, but in that, when I joined in 1990, he took us to another level of fitness. You know, we were, uh, that when we hit that straps in 1993, it was because of two years of investment by him, the 10 200s, the, the coat hangers, the stuff that we used to do uh, around Clethley to build our stamina and repeat fitness allowed us to have clarity in those last 20 minutes and allowed us to play more because we were fitter. Um, so Gareth was a is, a is an inspirational bloke. You know, we had our first trip together, non-involvement in rugby, to Japan. So me and him went to Japan as uh, we were tour guides. And it was the best experience I've had since I retired. And I understand why people are supporters now, because I've never supported because I've only ever played from the age of five to when I finished at 34. I didn't want to be involved after that, and I was working in the environment, never coached, but always worked in sport. That was the trip where we, we weren't working. We were just supporters, and we both got it. We never had that. He'd had the same, where really. he'd never not been involved from the age of 17, which is weird. And he's able to si simplify what's required in a game. Um, but he needed players, and that's why we connected, and I was 12 years with him, is that he was able to say what he wanted to, to happen in a game, but you've got to deliver the game plan. And when the pressure's on, it's hard to deliver the game plan. When you're slightly going off kilter, when mistakes happen. Um, and that's why, and he's, he was able to say the same thing every game, but it would seem like it was different, but still inspirational. His team talks weren't complicated, but he was able to do that. With Wales, when he coached us, he was the assistant coach in 94 when we won the championship. And when Alan Davis, the coach, fell on his sword yeah. after his, he left, um, and quite, you know, he, it was a, an honour thing not to stay. He could have stayed, but didn't, fell on his sword. When he came back and uh, got involved with Leslie again, it was fantastic. When he had the opportunity to coach Wales, when they gave it to Ruddock, they should have given it to, yeah. to Gareth. The reason they didn't give it to Gareth was Gareth saw the whole picture of how Wales needed to be resolved. So you've got to get the, the strong foundation to get that right. Yeah. He wanted to, in his presentation, wanted to change the world and put that investment in now to make sure there's some, to future proof the national team. That scared the WRU, I think, at the time. Um, and it wasn't, even though that was his time, it wasn't his time, if you know what I mean. And then when he got the opportunity with the World Cup and with Wales, I remember meeting him on the side door at the Millennium Stadium just before the press conference. And I said, don't forget now, whatever you've done in your previous career as a player and a coach will be erased. Because only one coach has never been has ever been sacked, and that was Steve Anson. Everybody else has been sacked as a coach, and so it's you know even though I you could be it's highly unlikely 
So he said, I'd never forgive myself if I didn't try. And he's a passionate guy. And, he, and <clears throat> if you look back at the records, the opportunities that him and Nigel ga Davis gave to players in their journey, Alan Wynne-Jones, yeah. James Hook, that trip to Argentina when it was, a, you know, it was an ill-fated trip. They took players to give them experience. And then it was that crazy thing in the World Cup. You know, that whole madness that surrounded Gareth Thomas prior yeah. to that. It was a very difficult time for everybody concerned. You know, for him, I think Gareth wanted to give Gareth Thomas the captaincy. And then there was that whole stuff in the background. And there was a great group of players who were flourishing and had development opportunities. Um, but they were, you, they were what, one conversion or one penalty away from beating Fiji. And that was what it came down to. And I, I've yeah. I talked to him about, I've gone through this with him. And I said, what was the game plan? And it was what you would, me and you would think would be the game plan against Fiji. Do not play loose. Do not go fast and frenetic. Let's wear them down. Let's simplify it. Let's tighten. Let's strangle. Let's play. And we, we, we didn't. And we still scored tries, but we missed critical kicks. Half time. I said, what was the team for half time? For Christ's sake! <laughs> tighten! Don't! And they did. But if you remember, one individual ran instead of going under the post to, for the conversion, didn't. Given the whole, I won't name names, we missed the kick, critical kicks, lost the game. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was aware that morning, the Welsh Rugby Union announced that we were losing money. There was an announcement of the, well, the WRU was losing money. And they announced it in the morning of that game. The headline, they were flushing out the debts, basically. And unfortunately, Gareth was a casualty the next day because he had to be. And that was hard for him. And I spoke to him on the Sunday morning. Once I heard, I phoned him there in France. And I said, look, I'll meet you. I'll pick you up. And he was a, an indiv you know, a proud man, you know. And they, uh, you know, they, it was difficult for him to reconcile. But he has. And he understood it was a business decision, not a personal decision. And that's what selection is these days, whether you're a coach yeah. or a player. It ain't personal. It's business. The business I, of winning. Yeah. I don't think anyone uh, sort of involved in rugby took any pleasure out of that. Because Gareth Thomas, uh, sorry, uh, Gareth Jenkins is such a, as Fraser said, likeable right. guy. And, you know, he'd done so much. I mean, such a figure in Welsh rugby. I don't think anyone took any any sort of no. pleasure out of that and i think he has no regrets because he's proud of having a go yeah and making a difference to people in their careers and i think again like people talk fondly about steve hansen they will talk fondly about gareth mm. gareth isn't perfect who is i'm not mm. who is there are lots of people nobody has every tool in the box whether you're warren gatland steve hansen eddie jones scott they don't no. I know all of them. <laughs> I know all of them. And they, by their own admission, they're not. Um, Gareth is a likeable guy. You know, earned his stripes. You know, you, you wear your blood on your sleeve and your heart on your sleeve and you you a likeable guy. And it, it was painful, painful for him. But, you know, we, we, he looks back fondly for that. And mm. sometimes you, can, you can't, can, you can only control what you can control. And Steve Anton is all about control. Mm. There were, things that were going on in that around that he wasn't in control of. And you just have to go, well, give my best, give it my best shot. It's a bit like me on the bike. There's my bike staring at me again. <laughs> You've got to just give it your best shot. You've just got to give it your best shot. But just uh, just take you back a little bit there, where you were on about personalities and back to me and everything. It's, it's hard to believe that you know, you're 19, 20, you know, you're thinking of youngsters that age today. But, uh, you know, you were uh, a character yourself, like, you know, you, you know, uh, you name all these characters, but, you know, I, you sort of grew up uh, where I grew up in the era where you were playing and, uh, and you were a character. And I've got to say, because if I don't say it, there'll be mates of mine watching this I was in school with and played youth rugby with, 
will say I was a Neath supporter. You know, I you know, yeah, yeah. yeah we had you know, down in West Wales in Saint sort of Saint David's, you had those who were Scarlets through their families or Slesley through their their dads and stuff like that, and and then you had the likes of Brian Williams. Kevin Phillips, Roland Phillips, going Don Davis, Don Davis yeah, going yeah. to to Neath, uh, which which we follow Neath. We used to go up on buses and watch Neath and everything. And some of us really didn't like Snesley. Yeah. And, and you were one of those characters, like yo, know, because they'll say, I'd be saying, oh, you know, you were you were hey. like, a, yeah, you it was. But then, you know, when it came to, uh, I think the early nineties. You know, Slesley had, had overtaken Neath then, you know, from that, that dominance Neath had in the late 80s, I think. And, and you know, we, we talked about you beating Australia and, and you you guys came down to St. David's uh, team building. Yeah, what a trip. I love yeah, it, there. Well, well, I was, uh, I, just going back, I was about 19 then myself. I was t I took you co-steering. Yeah, uh, Andy Smith. Yeah. Andy Smith was the journalist uh, who worked for Eurosport and, uh, and that. But yeah, we did the co-steering. That yeah. was my... First and only experience of coasting, what a hell of a thing. Well, I was just start. I was working for the company at the time, TYF, uh, you know, sort yeah. of like a trainee, and uh, we took you out. I was sort of like a, a trainee with them, and uh, yeah, and, and you guys. Well, you that, that would that have been 94? Yeah, about that. It's been 93, 94. Yeah. yeah it was a great time, boiling hot as well. Yeah, because it was, and it was a. Uh, do you remember coming down to uh, the Surf Life Saving Club to do the awards? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The World Championship said, I always always remember this, so I can say, because you were a character there. And uh, we had Huntington Beach from uh, California who were competing and were giving out the awards. And uh, and the awards were quite, as they were, quite stale. You know, it was a, an old doc who, uh, a legend in, in the Surf Life Saving Club, was shaking hands there. And you had a baseball hat on at the time. And you said, oh, I, I'll liven this up. And you turned your hat around. And uh, you gave one of the girls a kiss, you know, as you were uh, giving mm -hmm. out the award. Uh, so, some blonde girl from uh, California. So then the the doc, uh, who uh, the next one, who was someone came up, lovely long blonde hair. So he did the same thing, gave him a kiss, and it was a, it was a bloke, <laughs> so a bloke with long hair. <laughs> <laughs> Down and go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just looked at the guy who was looking at him, but uh, yeah, and I was always because that, that brings me back to uh, obviously, you know, you guys were amateur, you know, you were I was still in the amateur age, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but you were still doing that community stuff and you know, and coming down and doing the awards, yeah. and and you know, you were you were a real uh, a real character of that, and where I was going with that, so I was is that then. When you finished at your rugby, sort of took you away to, you know, you did, you've done loads of work in the media. You've had your own TV yeah. programs and. Well, in that in that period of time, I'll go back to that letter. I've still got that letter from Tom Lyons about giving people time. Mm. And when I was, when we were became we were successful, then people asked for support or bringing focus on charity events, and so you were always encouraged through the club, certainly through Lethley, to get involved. It was always about your representing Gareth Jenkins' team tour, you're representing this town and this area. You know, you're them, you're 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 they're playing the game with you, so give them time. Um, going back to that point about why people didn't like Clethley and the Scarlets, in that we thought that everybody loved Clethley when it went from Clethley to Scarlets in '95. Yeah. But in reality, hundred years before, people had their local clubs had been pilfered by Athletley. The better players from Whitland yes. and Narberth and further field would come and be drawn to Athletley. So there was a resentment in junior clubs further west because yes. their best players had been drawn to play for, you know, from Tenby, you know, the, yes. uh, wherever it was, to play for Athletley. So there wasn't a love when you're talking about that. And then there were players that didn't get in the team that drove past Athletley because they didn't fit in the culture and went to Neath. Yeah. So there was this, oh, everybody loves it. Well, actually, they don't because of what you've said, because yeah. it's, it's hereditary in some ways that it's just happened from years gone by. So we recognised in 94 that we've got to work hard to get people to understand us and get into the community and go in doing some missionary work in West Wales and going that way 
to St David's and other areas. Uh, you know, we were in Irish Broadly, we went to North Wales, lots of places to just try and say, well, we're this is what we're about. If we have the same values, support us because it was not a given that everybody loved Cletley or the Scarlets, and that you have to work hard. Mm. With for me, going back to the personality stuff, it was those humbling experiences that grounded me seeing those situations that you're going to support where people are in challenging, you know, whether it's illness or doing stuff to support a family member, whatever it would be. And you're just attending, they're actually doing allowed me to have an enthusiasm to respect what people were doing and that unusual name, unusual look success of being a captain on a team. I got, interviewed to do a TV program. It was called Telephone In, when we, in 94 it was, yeah. ITV and a woman, a producer from North Wales had said, come and have a screen test. We'd like you to do some TV work. And I was like, oh, okay, just be yourself. And I used to do a live TV program on a Sunday, five o'clock, which was a live quiz program for an hour. It was a phone in. And I was one of the pre presenters with Alvon Haynes Davis and Sean Thomas. Now, if that's not a bloody character building because it's scary, you're interviewing celebrities like Mandy Smith, who was married to Bill Wyman and others, and we were having phone calls, live audience. I played the day before, so I'd be playing on the Saturday, go in at seven on a Sunday morning, bashed, and I didn't drink in those days, bashed and bruised and scars in my face, made up, put on, hour, do rehearsals, learn to do how to do the autogue, do the program. We did that for years. And I had TV and media experience for radio and TV. From that, I was on S4C, BBC had a talent show, Moon and Stars had a radio show on Capital, on, radio, on Red Dragon in those days. And so it was great experiences. Um, but eventually, there was going to be a time when I was going to have to get a proper job. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the media thing was lovely but I wasn't good enough to have it as a full-time living. And so moving out of that into the work environment was something when I returned back to work for the WRU then. Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, varied CV, to be fair. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think... Well, I mean, work for the union for 10 years, WRU, yeah. two stints. One as the head of commercial when we were in a difficult place and we took it to a better place and created a team and three of the team I employed back then, 2005, and are still working in the commercial department. One of them is the head, which is, makes me so proud. Yeah. One is the head of commercial, Craig Maxwell, and his wife, Tracy, and Alex Luff, who does all the events, are still there, which is satisfying. And when Roger Lewis, we shake, shook hands and went separate ways because he advised me to go and do some other things, and come back another day. He got me to come back another day and set that team up in North Wales, North Wales yeah. which was a, a fantastic experience. A little bit political, a little bit commercial, and a little bit rugby, working for Conway Council at the time as well. And it's just fabulous how that has flourished. And I just hope that continues. Yeah. Briefly touch on this, through. Where do you think you've left that now, the state of rugby in North Wales and moving forward? How much of a stronghold is it? I know RGC have made great strides, for example. I had an unwritten five-year plan and then I had a, a ten-year plan. I was yeah. three years with the Scarlets because my, my friend, who's the chairman, had asked me to come and help. So I'd come and help to be the, the commercial director. We got the debt down and tried to get the... He asked me to make this new house feel like home, which was the Park of Scarlets, which we did together on and off the field. And I did that for three years. Going up to North Wales was five-year plan was to get into the Premiership and a ten-year plan was to be a region. Um, and I was surrounded by some great people up there who'd, who I used to think that everybody in North Wales used to think were very bitter about the fact that they'd been left alone for a, even though they a founder member uh, yeah. for odd years. And uh, I used to think it was teams used to hate um, North Wales, but actually teams that we used to play against just were parochial and didn't like anybody other than their own team. <laughs> North Wales um, is so big geographically with only 32 teams. It was a challenge um, because you've got 10,000 square miles between and a million people basically living in that anywhere from yeah. Brecon up 
and across up to Anglesey and across to Wrexham. The investment was to give the kids of North Wales some sort of opportunity which was within touching distance because the sparsity of teams was difficult for them to feel it was attainable to avoid what George North did in reality, which was have to pack his bags and come south. Mm. Um, yeah. It worked. Some great coaches from Chris Horseman to Phil Davis to Mark Jones artificially inseminated experience in a nice way because mm. it was a you had to bring knowledge and experience to fast track what was required. A young invest, and that was where Hanson uh, and all the experience I had investing in 18 year olds then playing in Division 1 East against Gilbert Bork and Triorki and other teams in that valley down there, Hale Q, and allowed them in three or four years later to be battle-hardened, to be ready to win the premise, to win the cup that Mark Jones mm. did years later. And that team, that was a fantastic five years it got to. And now they're in this crossover period of what do you do with them next? Yeah. It's been going now eight years. Eight years. Now, the chance is now to make it, and it was always the vision to make it a Connaught. Five years premiership, ten years Connaught. It took ten years from nowhere to somewhere. This is the time they've got to do something with what North Wales has done in, since the last eight I don't know what their plan is. I'd have asked Ryan Jones when it was uh, before. I think only Ryan can answer that. He was going on too much about his marathon to, to talk. I know. Well, you know, he, he's the guy in charge of the whole thing. Yeah. Not mates. Yeah. I know he's a mate of yours and he's a good guy. Yeah. His first job was in charge of community rugby, which was challenging. Yeah. And that, that, then he changed to this role now as the head of professional rugby. And it, it is, I don't know who he seeks counsel from, but I hope he is, because whatever is, now's the time, unfortunately, with coronavirus, the pieces are up, and now we can do what we can do, a strategy to change the future, to allow us to all have a future in rugby. That's a, that's a burden to weigh on his shoulders. Yeah. I, hope he, I don't know who he's talking to. No. That's, a big, that's a biggie. As your second job yeah. you've ever had. Yeah, I know he's I, a man, I, I, it's a it's a biggie. It is. It is a big one. It's it's going to be hard. To, it's going to be hard for rugby to come back in lots of different, you know, any sport and everything to come back, isn't it? And it will it you know, will when life changes, yeah. doesn't it? And, uh, yeah. and as as the negative, I'm a believer in positive. The, you know, the everything's happened. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah. There's going to be a realignment, and there's going to be a positive people that are going to grab this, and the energy will drive it yeah. forward. It's like the, the high street will change; it will, everything's going to change. But look, it just everything changes. It is. It yeah. does. You talk to someone who's 103. By me, <laughs> you know, you know, it does. You know, you can't overthink that. You're just going to look forward and go. This is an exciting opportunity for for what rugby is about to happen. It's yeah. a, you know, I was with Robin McBride talking to him over the wall as I was on my walk. He lives at the top of the road and I was doing my uh, exercising and there he was talking about what possible changes is going to happen with Leinster and the game. And yeah. It is amazing. It is amazing. But I'm excited by what might be. Yeah. As long as it keeps igniting the flame in the brain of young people to what, aspire yeah. mm -hmm. to perform for us, but also to realise that you, you've got 35 years of your life after rugby mm. <laughs> to, to do. So get some tools in your box. I um, mean, that, that, that is the thing, isn't it, which we've touched on a few times, is when you've been in the amateur game and, uh, you know, you've had that work experience, you've had that life experience whilst you're playing, or, and then, like yourself, you became pro as well, but you still had that experience where... The guys who went straight into the academies and professional rugby, you know, by 30, you 35, you're looking for something, yeah, and something it's, else to do. And you, know, you probably haven't made enough money out of the game to, to sit back and not worry about that. It's, uh, you know, that's... One does, whether you're, you know, whoever you are, you know, whether you're Dan Carter or not, you know, you're, however much money you're going to earn, you either live to your means and you're, it's just, it's all relative. You're, and even if you've got enough money, you're a long time retired to do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
how you give back. And you talk to millionaires, and I remember they want to make a difference, and you you want to have a reason to get up in the morning. Mm. Uh, it, you know, and I'm working with a, a property group now, and we talk about growing and developing. How much do you want? You know, uh, what do you what do you want? You know, how big is the house want to be? How you know how many cars do you? What is it that we want? What do we want in life? You know, and I think the simplicity of what this has created and this, this Corona thing of being at home is there's actually simple things, isn't it? <laughs> it the is. simplicity of, re of connecting with the important people that matter, you know, through Zoom or whatever it is and making time. The simplicity of what you actually need, whether it's the, the bog, the bog roll <laughs> or just understanding what you, you know, with the fear of what you can afford. Yes. Um, and I and I think it'll I think it'll it'll, it'll it'll all flush out in a positive way what the future holds and I think players are becoming more switched on to the fact that it's there are only so many spots available. Yeah. Um, the Welsh Rugby Union under Josh Lucy when he was had Brian's job made a big call and I was working for him at the time and and Joe Lydon prior to that about putting rugby coaches back into schools and it seems an odd thing and i you know i said that's you ain't going to be able to do that how are you going to afford to do that he wanted to put coaches because that was the only way we were going to ignite the flame in the brain of kids in the in a in an environment where they didn't have a choice to be there school and so what he's at, he aspired to and with the support of some key people in the wiu and the sports council for wales is allow these hub offices i don't know if you're aware yeah yeah, yeah no few are you and half for the school yeah, yeah. But what it was actually yeah. do was get to the kids early brainwash them boys and girls brainwash them early they had to play rugby in school <laughs> and they, they didn't have because not every kid has a parent or a guardian that's able to take them to train in midweek or on a sunday mm. Uh, they're not and that because li life isn't perfect most families are dysfunctional uh, uh, lots but lots of people don't have that luxury of being able to take get someone to take you to rugby but if it's in school you have to do it and then it goes once you're there then you're excited and then you want to have a go yeah. and then you'll go to a club and that's breed life into the game and fill junior sections but that can what happens after that is, is critical from 16 is yeah. You can't be a pro if you can't be a pro don't lose your heart and soul about rugby and uh because most of these kids who come into this fast tracked into academies when they're not when they're cut they yeah. give them all together just uh, just touching on what you were saying there about uh you know the hub officers yeah i mean <clears throat> you know we had a young lad on here uh the other day uh, a boy who i used to coach he's only 19 20 now in university uh and you know, was one of our better players in St. David's, went on to the Scarlet setup, and uh, and now is in university. But, I mean, with the hub officers locally, there is a there is a local hub officer, who, you know, in Fishguard, unfortunately, being in Fishguard, our rivals, who was very good, you know, and, and he's managed to, you know, like engage the children. He goes in, he helps out, and he runs different age groups himself. And, you know, ideally what you want like you know out of out of yeah. it and it's created sort of definitely a strong mini and junior section but then you know what we were speaking to tommy about the other day when he was on was uh you know when you get to that 15s 16s and it used to be you'd go and play for pembrokeshire and that would be you know well done you know you're playing for pembrokeshire something you can be proud of so as yeah. an achievement but now it's sort of put down as scarlet west and so you're in scarlet west and as soon as you go there what what you're looking at is am i going to make the scarlet setup so it's almost like a trial for the scarlet setup and unfortunately a lot of the kids don't make it because that's the way it is and i noticed with the team i was coaching when the boys came back from the scarlet west and the ones who were sort of told you're not making the full squad they did lose a bit of interest they thought you know I've That's lost, it. You know, I've, That's I've, uh, I'm not going to be a professional rugby player. I'm not going to play for the Scarlets, uh, and and we we have so many of those drop away. You know, it's uh, it's an unfortunate, and that that's the the, the problem is yeah. our, our academy system is too good. 
So we produce a lot of talent because of what's happened, what you talk about, because you as a coach have worked with kids from the age of five or six. We've got lots of volunteers. We're giving back, you know, coaching our sons or family members, whatever it is, producing skillful, talented, and we've got some good, as you said, the system is ruthless in Scars East, Scars West, and then it's filtered into Scars under 16s. And if you fall by the wayside, but still the cream floats or whatever that coach wants at the time, goes into the academy, you get a two-year deal, and then you get a, or a five-year deal, which gets you to 16 to 21. And it feeds in, and you only need a few of these players to come out of that under-18 system to feed the Scarlets. I think it, there is some, I don't know whether I'm getting the number wrong, but it feels like there's something like three or four players per region per year mm. because to feed the system. Now, you think what that's come from, and I know in, in the Scots region, there's 50-odd uh, clubs, is it? I think it's something like that. But there's a lot of junior sections that are feeding through. So, But the Scots don't think about and can't think about and doesn't have the resource to think about that 15-year-old kid that doesn't make it. Mm. And that's the responsibility of Welsh Rugby Union, is it? Mm. Is it the responsibility of the club to pick up the piece of that kid that now has lost his desire, you know, he's feeling down, but then could he look at Liam Williams who didn't make it either and was picked up late and look what happened to him as, you know, and able to come back later on, you know, I was dropped in 95 and five years later, I, as 32 year old, I ended up playing for Wales again, you know, which is unbelievable. But who are the people that are inspiring the 15 year old we're relying on your mate, Tommy, the hub officer, who's a lovely kid, who's 19 or whatever it is. He's on a cheap, low salary. I've played for the WIR. He's wet behind the ears and life experience aren't there. And you've got to get him to peer, peer, peer mentor a kid that's feeling depressed and doesn't want to play because he's got no reason to play other than playing the same team as his mates. But he hasn't been playing with his mates because he's been off in Scarlet's yeah. West with the gear. And he's yeah. at the gear and doing extra training. And so his mates have kind of moved on for a year. And at that age, it happens really quick, doesn't it? it does. And it's a, it's a difficult conundrum that does that fall under Ryan or Geraint? Because that's community game and professional game combined, doesn't it? It's a, that local club needs that kid who's talented enough to get into Scarlet's West to carry on playing. Because if he doesn't carry on playing and then transition, you know, it, there is no club. No. And he, once you've lost him, you've lost him. And that awful statistic. And when I was in North Wales, we were going to trial something which was under 16s, under 17s, under 18s on a Sunday. So I coached, I, I coached my son. I'm an assistant, assistant coach. I'm not actually the coach, I'm just the bloke who has the balls anyway. If you, I've done it for eight years. So if I'm my son's 16 then, and under 16, so he goes across to play youth. There's a 19 year old scrum off there. He ain't going to get a game. Mm -hmm. So that's a Saturday. And uh, so I'm lost. So I haven't got anything I've been doing for the last years on a Sunday. What am I going to do? So I, if my son doesn't play on a Saturday and I'm not involved in anything on a Sunday, you lost two people then. Mm. Him and me. So the idea was, in England they do it, under 17s, under 18s, you stay and then you become an adult at 18. You either go and work or you go to college or whatever it is. And then they go into a development thing. So their youth rugby doesn't exist. They don't have cults, I don't think, in the same way. Mm -hmm. But for us, it would be a development or a second team. That's the, you know, really has to go that way because otherwise these kids aren't connected in this... Yeah, I, I, I have to wrap up in a few minutes, Rupert. So just so you know, just before um, I think Fintan will finish off with a bit of a lockdown lowdown with you. But before that, there is just one. You've actually touched on it. There's one rugby experience I want to ask about. It's two thousand February 2000. You haven't played for Wales for six years. Am I right by then? You, yeah, you five, yeah, yeah, five, six years, yeah. Cheapers, yeah. You're, th you're 32 by this point. Sorry, maybe four years. You're 32 by this point. Um, and you get the call up from Graham Henry. <laughs> experience because it was a strange time for Wales because you'd had the high of the Henry year in 99 he'd hit his first real rough patch Wales had taken a hiding against England in the opening game Rob Howley who it was inconceivable to think that Rob Howley wouldn't be in the Henry setup as 
his mainstay as captain in 99 was suddenly dropped. There was a, a lot going on in the press. The Shane Howarth and Brett Sinkinson saga broke. I think that was actually the first game they mix, they missed uh, yeah. since Granny and never played for Wales again. <laughs> what was the whole experience like for you? It just came out the blue. Yeah, well, yeah, it was it was bizarre. And Graham had come out in the, the press. We'd been having a... Uh, Scots had been doing well in Europe. I think we'd, yeah. uh, we'd had some really big performances. And he'd said that, um, that I was too old to play for Wales and it would never happen on his watch. And then not long later, I'm literally getting a call from the team manager saying, uh, can you come and train? I remember I was having a breakfast <laughs> breakfast roll in McDonald's. I think it was like on a Tuesday morning or something. I was like, I was like can you come down? I was like, yeah, yeah. So I came down. And I, I literally remember being excited about the whole experience and thinking, crikey but also being so knackered and feeling every aspect of the pain in my body, being a 32-year-old uh, with lots of things wrong with me at that stage. But you always have to be careful what you dream for because I always thought I, I could do it and I'd love a second chance. But to have been in, in, that, in that environment, and it was with some young players, Shane was involved, yeah. the Jones was fly half. There was a lot of instability and a lot, a lot of lack of confidence. And yeah, the Granny Gate stuff, I'll never forget, we were training on the Sunday and then we woke up on the Monday morning and they literally, the invisible side, went bum, 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 got rid of them and gone. And, you know, there was two of us, me and Charver in the team, obviously, we got a school in Warsaw. <laughs> so yeah. we were like, by me. And it, I never forget Graham coming to me saying, oh, look, um, we've got Scotland, you, you know, you're, you're going to be involved and you might have to be captain. And I was like, what? What? Well, Di, you know, I wanted Di Young to be captain because obviously, you know, he's got that yeah. experience solidity up front. And I was like, and he, but his calf's bad. So get your head in the game. <laughs> and I was like, Christ. And that week was, it was just incredible. And it was a, an amazing experience to, to run out at the Millennium Stadium because I played in the old place. And then to play yeah, out. that's right. Yeah. But it was a, a scary experience. And you remember every aspect of it, the journey coming in, the week, the night before, the coming out the dressing room and being held in the players' tunnel for ages. And we were singing and, and every aspect, I could see people in the crowd. It was magnified like a million times. And every mistake, you think, oh, Christ. It was, but it was just, you fly so high in that with the crowd. And then the pain after was... I'd never been aching and in so much pain and took me to recover. But I had a couple of years and playing under Graham and having opportunities just to steady the ship and have confidence to play and believe and organise. So it was great. And I'll never forget, you know, at the end of that champ, the second 2001, I think it was, he said, right, you know, thanks for what you've done. We had a glass of wine and, you know, you really helped me in this period. And um, I was very grateful for that. And at the same time, I was having the same conversation with Gareth. Life ain't going to get better than this, mate. You know, there's Mike Phillips, there's Dwayne Peel, there's others around, you know. And, he, and it's hard because I could have gone on. I was 35. I felt like even though I stepped together with tape and stuff, but I made the right decision to go at a point where I'd played for Wales. I was involved with a successful Scarlets team. Gutted that I'd retired because I was on the Lions trip and I was the number, whatever it was. And I'd had a, that's a whole different podcast, that is, how close I got to being on that trip in 2001. So I was in Australia because of Graham yeah. again. But it was yeah. brilliant times, brilliant times. And I was very fortunate, very fortunate. Well, yeah, that was, uh, that was some comeback there. And just to clarify a point I said earlier as well, was uh, back before that, in your first pick at Wales, uh, and I was thinking about being a Neath man, I would have had you before Chris Bridges in the Welsh set up, though. <laughs> yeah, even, even though you were a Scarlet, I would have still picked you before Chris Bridges. <laughs> exactly half the, game, half the games each that, and he played, I played in the semi final, he played in the final of the Cup. So I was involved in. I've been held in eight cup finals and won six, seven with Clefley and one with Neath. And we were, well, it's incredible. But I remember scoring five tries for Neath against my steg <laughs> at my steg because of the pack we had. Yeah. It was a great time. Great time. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, that's great. Are you going to... Uh, are you all right, Fraser? Are you got, yeah, Fraser's good. got to go nope. to work. He's, I'll, I'll, see like, I'll, the, huh? I'll see you through the lowdown. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unlike me, I've got... Uh, time is my own. Uh, right, so... I'm on furlough. I'm on furlough, so... Yeah. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> bizarre scenario. Yeah, we'll see how long that lasts now. We've got, I think, another couple of weeks, haven't we? Yeah. So, well, if we... That yeah, brings us on nicely, really, to uh, <laughs> we'll finish off on the lockdown uh, lowdown. So, I'm going to give you choices now. If we were stuck in in lockdown for another three or four weeks, uh, you know, what, what your choices would be. Uh, some are going to be choices that you take with you. So, uh, right, social media or TV, which one would you give up? Um, TV. Yeah. No, you give up TV. Yeah. Oh, you know, you're the yeah. second person to say that. Was the other other person was nineteen. Everyone else, all the adults, said they'd give up social media. <laughs> I, 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 a, I like the um, the bite-sized stuff that you yeah. get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally, you get snapshots of incredible stuff. Yeah. Now. You filter out the rubbish, but you get yeah. you learn so much from it. I like it. Okay. Yeah, that's very very true. Uh, and something we haven't touched on now is uh, obviously you said you mentioned you were from uh, Walsall, Walsall and Antig Eric. Antig Love them, Antig. Down the road there, it's uh, yeah. it's literally stone's throw there. I'm a stone. Dravark boy now, but yeah. Oh, yeah. And down with Nantes and Davies, there's another one. You were, yeah. yes. Yes. You with were. Julian Jones oh, Lewis. Like, that was a me and the air Jules, and we were in the pub. I still yeah. meet people that I don't remember talking to. <laughs> we got yeah. really good. In the clubhouse, fabulous. And then whatever pub that was in town. And I, I come down with my caravan, so I'm in White Sands quite regularly. And I always come across people that is a, have a, I've had blurry conversations with. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out in St. Davies. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> the pro or amateur days? Well, we had the best of times, didn't we? Amateur. 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 Parky Scarlet or Straddy? Straddy is, the, is, the, <laughs> is our only home. And then the last one then, which was uh, a big nine battle at the time or uh, in the media or talked about so much now. Bishop or Jones? Bish, you see, is my mate. And Rob's a good mate of mine, but Bish took care of me and gave me some life experiences. My brother pulled him out of a canal, bizarrely, in uh, Amsterdam Sevens. They were mates. And then Bish vowed to, I will pay you back by looking after you and your own. And then he took me under his wing when I moved to Wales. And, and I used to meet him on a Saturday night in Cardiff with the Cordell brothers and have experiences in nightclubs in Cardiff under Di Bish's wings. Blind God, man. I'm to him now. The stuff I never want to see or say or whatever. <laughs> that but yeah. it was an incredible thing. So the Bish. The Bish. The Bish. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, uh, Rupert, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Uh, you know, some great stories here. And, uh, you know, thanks for giving your time up and coming here. Uh, yeah, a real true uh, Scarlets and uh, Welsh rugby legend. Oh, man. Really Thanks for asking. Hey, appreciate really that. Appreciate Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's lovely to be asked, you know. And uh, oh. 52, it's a long time ago that I retired. Well, I mean, over 20 years, but it's, it's great to reminisce. And it's uh, been, you know, very fortunate to meet some lovely people along the way. And uh, long may it continue. Oh, yeah, definitely. Look forward to coming and do a bit of co-steering down with you. I tell you what, next time you're down your caravan of White Sands, give us a shout. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you'll have to come down and do one of our bike events or something as well. Or, or maybe... Coast will be back up. Coast Park Cubs Maris. Back up. Yeah. Was, yeah, I was going to say, or, or the other lockdown question could be, pub or Coast Path Marathon? <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. I did that marathon by accident a couple of years ago, the Snowdonia one, when I was the sweeper <laughs> at the back. Oh, I ended yeah. up doing the whole thing. It took me a day. Um, I don't know if I have an intention to do another one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stay in the pub. But we yeah. might, I'll come and do some co steering or we'll have a go at some doing my kids. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely bring, bring them down. Give us a shout and, uh, when you're down. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, brilliant. Thank you.